That's maybe wonderful. I'll, shall I share it while we? Welcome to the second of a Parkinson's Primer series of five. This one is focused on dance, boxing, and other exercises. It's going to give you a nice overview of how to choose the best exercise for you. We're joined again by Josefa Domingos, who is a physiotherapist in Portugal, and John Dean, who is a speech and language pathologist in Portugal as well. And they have a combined 30 plus years of Parkinson's experience. Thank you both for continuing the series for our Parkinson's population, and please take it away. Well, well thank you for joining us, folks. Uh, it's, it's really fun to be here. We always love this. Uh, the Parkinson Foundation of Western Pennsylvania is really a, just a great community, so we always love coming and talking with you folks. And uh, we met some of the new people on your team. Your team is growing. It's been really cool. Like, great to see you guys getting out in your community like you do. It's great. Um, we're yeah. here today to talk just a little bit about exercise, <laughs> and um, I'm going to yeah, let you just have a start with it. Let's say you you hear a lot of talks about exercise, so we find we have to find new ways to you know approach the the topic. And I would say that we are here today to discuss um, an interesting problem. And the problem is <laughs> there's so many choices at this moment. So I think that uh, is a good problem. It's a good problem for us to have. When I started working with Parkinson, uh, we had absolutely almost no choices. So we weren't even doing physiotherapy with Parkinson at that time. And so to see how much we have grown since then is really great. And at this moment, I wouldn't say that the challenge is for us to find ways to help people make the best choices. And that's why we are here today to try to to contribute to that problem. One I wanted to share with you, it's uh, one of the most common I would, solutions to that problem that you hear very frequently is do the exercise you like. And I'm wondering how many people have heard this before? Yes. The oldest joke, I think. <laughs> uh, so I think it's it's very uh, interesting. I have mixed feelings about this answer. First of all, it generalizes a lot. And uh, we wanted to give you a personal perspective from our experience. Like, uh, I think above all, people like solutions to their problems. So if, if we could only do everything we like, we might not get to the solutions of the problems, right? So I think we should look into this in a way that people are, when they respond this, it's probably associated to the fact that motivation is usually an issue in Parkinson. And so we want desperately people to exercise. So we want to make this as less complicated as possible. And, you know, do what you like, do what you like. You will hear this often. So just to highlight that that is coming probably from the motivation perspective that we just want people, if you compare it to nothing, any exercise you do is good. So I think we have to have key messages that we want to transport with you and the other one would be, okay, so if we look at this in a way that imagine it's medication and if I choose a specific type of medication, I probably will get a specific kind of result, right? So yes, exercise is very important. If I'm not motivated, I will have to tr struggle to get to something that I like. So we try to not create barriers there. But above all, if I do want it to work just more and benefit me more, the more you know specific it will be the more efficient it will be so we'll try to see what does this mean in terms of your daily choices is my uh, english okay for everyone good <laughs> i tend to speak a little quick so just cue me <laughs> and so you one of the places where we go first when we try to uh, decide how to make choices we should be guided by evidence and this means a lot of research and a lot of um, uh, finance and resources and, and money is going to research so that we can get to a better place in terms of knowledge so that we can guide people better. So it's reasonable for us to go first to what does the scientific literature at this moment have to tell us? And this is just an example of a research study that came out recently that actually attempted to compare these 10 exercises that you see here. This is amazing work, right? So you have, um, and I know there probably is a lot of boxing lovers, and it's actually, this one does not include boxing. But uh, just, just to highlight a key message here, it's like you have different interventions that probably will address different outcomes. And what they were looking for is like, overall, what would one thing give 
what would one uh, a type of exercise uh, provide in terms of Parkinson keeping people motor symptoms? So their primary outcome was about how do people stay well in terms of Parkinson? And I wonder who can guess who the winner was. See the chat. <laughs> She's very excited about it, so you could probably take a guess. <laughs> yes. So dance is actually the one that, in terms of remember, it's the it's the what they were comparing is results from uh, the Unified Parkinson Disease Rating Scale is a tool that is used by commonly in the in the clinical community. The neurologist will be testing you with specific movements so that he can compare and to be able to keep up with the progression of the disease. So this dance was actually the one comparing to all of them that showed the best benefit over motor function measured by this tool and also the effects on balance. But this is very particular because you see we're comparing like, you know, treadmill training with yoga, you know, you, you would intuitively think they give different results, right? So it's it's good to keep in mind that what are we aiming for? So what is the best exercise for what problem, right? So we, for in this case, for motor function, dance seemed to have the best results and not all exercises were not in included. Okay, let's grab on to another example. So this is another research study that compared tango with treadmill walking and with stretching. And stretching is usually used as an active control group in research. So to have an intervention. What they were expecting, the, the researchers, is that the tango would probably have better benefits in terms of walking forward and backward. And they were actually very surprised to see that only the treadmill walking had benefits over forward and backward walking. And the stretching also had some results over the backward walking, but was not sustained over when they did a follow up of 12 months, uh, 12 weeks after. So it's interesting, sometimes we do research and we get surprising results. Well, so now was the stretching actually a control here? Yeah. So it was actually yeah. the one that they were using and then the other two were the active? Okay. To compare. Okay, yeah. okay. We have another example, which would be comparing two things that seem awfully similar, if you think about it. Because sometimes it's, it's hard in research to, to understand exactly what the protocol is, because sometimes it's not really well described. But more and more, the, it's requested for better publications. But in this case, just giving you an example of something that would be very similar. And the, I, I think the, the most important issue is like we are focusing here on the primary outcomes results would be anxiety and depression. And it's so difficult to have solutions for anxiety and depression that, you know, anything that comes is, is really helpful. And what they showed here is like, okay, comparing both, then the mindfulness yoga showed more benefit than the stretching and the resistance. But again, and it seems so similar that we would not expect this. I'm not going to go into details in terms of the mythology of the study, because then everything always, is always possible for us to question how these researchers are done, who is included. But just for us to get a general idea that there is research out there that's trying to understand what would be make most sense for us to be to guide people better. What we do know and a collective effort has been done so that uh, I think the only way that people can actually make choices if they understand what's supposed to be in each one of the activities that you have. And this is the results of the Parkinson Foundation recommendation exercise guidelines which is highlighting the need for specific, I'd call it, ingredients that you need to think about. Are they present or not in what I am doing? And the first one, and this is probably something that you've heard often every time you hear an, an exercise talk. I'm pretty sure this is a focus at this moment because we are disseminating these guidelines. And we have our, I would say, the main component here highlighted in red is the aerobic exercise where you are targeting your heart rate and you really want to have that effort and almost feel like out of breath and unable to to give um, to to do a sentence or to talk right so this is a recommendation that is usually combining with other research about three times a, a week I should do at least 30 minutes 150 minutes this is usually what people are hearing at this moment am I correct yes Okay, so I'm not going to go into, into more depth on it, just to tell you that, okay, so we have the aerobic exercise, we have the strength, we also have the balance and the agility and the dual tasking that were actually combined into one. 
mainly because there's also a known effect of how cognition influences balance and walking at the same time and how we have to have mental and motor agility to be able to to correspond to the activities we do in daily life like when we're walking and talking with someone right? and then again what i want to highlight in is this if we took this literally as it was studied it would fill up our week this would be a very scary week. You know, you, you'd have to retire to be able to do this, right? <laughs> if you are retired, you, this, this would be, okay, overwhelming week. So by logic, um, what therapists are, are trying to do and, and exercise professionals and everyone in the exercise community is how can we create activities that combine these ingredients um, and ultimately can have a good balance of it? So what we are aiming for now is how can we combine them in the activities that you are now seeing in available in your communities right but i do want to highlight something which is they not all at the same level of evidence and this is an important issue so it's if i decide to do three hours of stretching per week because i like doing stretching and I'm not going to do some form of aerobic exercise, which would be, you know, dancing, boxing, treadmill, walking. Aerobic can even be sitting and standing on the couch, right? That means that the choices that I'm making is not supported by the best evidence, so I probably won't get the best results. And I want to highlight again, if you can only do the stretching, then of course, compared to nothing, anything is good, okay? That's where your your situation of whichever exercise you'll do is the best exercise, but that's not really targeting all the key areas here. I think it's a lot about motivation and obviously okay. people struggle in different periods in terms of the disease process, uh, pro, uh, course is the better word. And so there might be moments where we feel more motivated or less motivated. We might have an issue that makes us more fatigued and so we don't really feel like what we were doing. So this has to be taken into account as we make changes in those choices as well. And so here's just to highlight that there's specifically, I would say, the aerobic, the resistance training, uh, the balance, those are really ones that you really want to focus on. And of course, people will say, what about stretching? Yes, you know, you feel good about it. But if you think about it, when we do mobility exercises in those big movements, you are also acting upon the rigidity. It's actually the best evidence that we have against making you less rigid is movement is those amplitude movements more than stretching so we come here to um let's see to this big to this issue where uh, what are the criteria that we're going to use to choose one or to choose the other so i've created this this image of like okay we have a red pill we exercise pill we have a blue pill when do i decide one or the other so I think we have to develop first before taking a choice is what is the criteria I'm going to use? So I think one of the major ones is what is your goal? You know, what, what is something that you really want is meaningful and matters to you that you want to work on and that will help you choose. And the other one is, okay, maybe I do want this, but I can only do this. I can only access this. So other things like all the barriers in terms of transportation, what what is closer to me am i going to go drive for one hour to get to a boxing class because i really like it or am i going to compromise and maybe have a 10 minute walk and go to the gym and do something else do you see so it's like we have to be reasonable in these choices and and life doesn't make that easy so let us have some idea uh, hypothesis or situations imagine we have someone that says i just want to stay well you know, I have Parkinson's disease, I feel good, I just want to keep the disease nice and calm without any problems. So no specific issues is what you're saying, is it? Yeah. No direct problem that you're trying to address. And so in that case, let's think again. My criteria is the best evidence says aerobic exercise is the one that keeps my disease well most. This is at least at this moment, at the level of evidence we have, it's mostly the aerobic component. What does this mean? So you have some examples here. So you have the dance, you have the walking, you have the bicycle, the boxing, ping pong, and I hear you guys are very into pickleball as well. Yeah. I was reading. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
very very i think it's it might be more charming than actually tennis tennis seems like a very big court to be running around <laughs> i just remember a friend of ours flying up to pittsburgh for a tournament you guys had in pre-pandemic days i mean i was like brian what's going on he's like yeah it's that good and i was like okay <laughs> Yeah, so when we think about, okay, so in these, if my goal is just to have some sort of exercise where I'm working on my aerobic component to keep my disease well, then yes, choose what you like. Why wouldn't you choose here pickleball, right? It, it corresponds to what you want, and these are different options. So I think sometimes that sentence that I was showing you is just out of place because it makes sense, but it makes sense in, for specific situations. Um, I would say each one of them will probably, each one of these examples will probably work better on one thing or the other. And we'll get into those examples later. We also welcome your questions regarding it. For example, I would say, imagine uh, ping pong, pickleball and tennis. It is focused on using one side more. Do you all agree? So it's like, we know that Parkinson has once is asymmetrical. It is a disease that usually affects one side more than the other. And one of the focuses about rehabilitation and any type of exercise is to reinforce the use of the less affected, of the most affected side, right? So, and I have this issue a lot because I have people here, oh, I want to play ping pong, but their, their right side is the best side, right? And so I said, can I challenge you to try to do it with your left hand? It's like, oh, that makes no sense, you know? So it's <laughs> these barriers, it's like, we can always adapt, but there has to be some willingness to do it, right? Does it make sense for the person to be overusing their less affected side? It doesn't, right? In terms of the knowledge that we have at this moment in terms of rehabilitation, and, and the problem with these activities is you do it for a long time. So I wouldn't say it's a problem, it's good. So imagine if your most affected side is the one that you're using all the time, for the tennis, for the pickleball, that's awesome. That's great. It's a beautiful activity for you to reinforce that. that. Uh, so first tip would be consider doing it with the other side. And even if you're not good with it, just keep going because that's your challenge, right? It's like a switch hitter in baseball. You should be able to do them both. And then maybe you can <laughs> use it. You can inflict it on your competition here. Um, so, just so make in, everyone do it as well, I would say. if you. <laughs> so someone in the, in the chat was asking about an activity. So like, what about yard work? Because they like mm -hmm. to be outside anyway. Okay. Where does that fit in the spectrum? Now I would say, imagine you have your exercise strategy. And I would say even more important than your exercise strategy is your activity strategy, which is throughout your day, being active as shown also to keep the, the course of the disease, the progression of the disease control, right? So it's very important. It's, it's a very good point uh, because it, at the end of the day, what we want is the, the brain to be stimulated in terms of oxygen, right, and movement. Uh, the exercise can bring additional advantage when it's structured, right? When it's specific for a problem that you might be having. And my only concern for daily activities, some, and I, I come from Portugal, right? So I have people that have lots of gardens. Uh, sometimes they really like working in the garden and they eventually, they, they hurt themselves a little bit too much because it's, it's kind of hard work. <laughs> so it's just being, you know, being a good sense in terms of whatever activity that you're doing that it it helps you stay well and doesn't hurt you but definitely it's um it's very good point it's a good activity i mean it, it counts for sure as exercise just making sure that it's addressing what you need and also not overdoing it you, know, you had somebody just yeah. the other day that was overdoing something with with ping pong and they, they hurt themselves even they were too much lower backboard uh, yes. Well, I usually say it's like uh, it's good that I uh, work with adults, and so obviously people take decisions. And the person really wanted to enter the competition of ping pong, and and she's been suffering from a low back pain with indication for surgery if rehabilitation doesn't work. And so I said, you know, I'm really concerned about you going to that. Um, and then she actually sneaked out, and she was telling everyone, I'm not going to tell Josepha that I went. <laughs> It's like, I'm not going to hit the person, right? It's uh, people are responsible, but now she actually might have to have surgery. Uh, so that's not. sad. No, that's a very Portuguese thing. I won't tell my therapist, as but, if Josepha wouldn't notice. <laughs> it's just, she didn't come in on Monday. It's like, oh, are you okay? Uh, so, yes, yeah, so these things do happen. It's like when we think about, you know, our title, what not to do. Uh, you know, if, in this case, she actually had direct guidance not to do it, but, you know, it choices. She didn't want to let down the team. Yeah. <laughs> well, it was actually that argument. So the oh. social connection that we will touch upon is very important. I think it's probably the same in pickleball. Those people are killers. I mean, they yeah. really are. So you mentioned we have another, another example. 
Now, here's a situation that people might feel their balance is not so good. Very com common in Parkinson. And it's like, okay, what do I do? Uh, which pill do I take? And just, I, I like to think this uh, like in, in Parkinson, you take your levodopa and you also have these other medications that help you, right? And it's the combination of that that actually gives you the better results. And in this case, I would say, I think ultimately everyone wants to keep their the, the course of the disease controlled, right? So the best evidence continues to be the aerobic exercise. So I would say, always take the red pill. <laughs> The red pill is important to always have it in the background. But yes, you want to focus on balance. The best evidence that we have at this moment is balance training. We have Tai Chi as very strong as well for, for, um, for balance. And we also have strength training of the lower limbs, so of the legs. So these are the ones that have more evidence. Doesn't mean the other ones don't work. But again, our criteria is what is already known. And let's try to combine that knowledge. But also keeping in mind that the red pill not only works on the aerobic, but we do have a lot of research supporting the dance, as you saw, for balance. You know, any other the bicycle maybe for balance, you can you can see by logic that probably it won't work so much. But you never know because it's kind of like the balance has so many influences. There's so much behind it. There's so many factors that can influence it. Including cognition, yeah. So the best suggestion I would say is like get to someone that can help you understand which are the factors that are influence your balance, so they can pinpoint where you should be going. Okay. Because so imagine it's the cognition maybe is influencing the balance, so you might want to go to a different type of program. Does that make sense for everyone? And it's interesting okay. how uh, the aerobic can actually influence cognition and uh, emotional state, like the psychological components of depression and have influences on sleep. So it really is the primary. But mm -hmm. then if you have a specific deficit, and again, I'm a speech language pathologist, so I would liken it to um, if you have a swallowing problem and maybe some of the speech protocols maybe have some evidence that swallowing is improved, I'm still probably going to do swallowing work, not just LSVT, even though there's a couple of well, there's a study about it. And so you, you want to make sure you're covering that because it's a serious issue. Same thing with balance. Okay, so this, these were two just examples. And uh, we did want to share maybe some key messages before we open up the floor to see um, if yep. there's questions about which pill do I take. <laughs> so um, pill. We want to be real clear. Pill. The exercise pill. The exercise exercise pill. <laughs> Okay, so message number one, I would say, uh, and we touched upon this, which is where are we at this moment in terms of Parkinson, which is, am I going to start exercise because maybe I had some surgery or some intervention or a pandemic happened to us and then we had to restart, right, uh, exercise. So that means that our exercise habits, where I am at the moment of my habits will influence what I choose. Right. If I'm trying to start, I'm going to try to start slow. If I'm going to, I'm trying to motivate myself, I'm going to try to get something that I like and then try to go to something more specific. But I can also be a person that's motivated by, no, I'm only going to do something that if it's really good for me, I have a lot of people like this. <laughs> it's like, just tell me something that's really meaningful, you know, the less that I have to do. <laughs> um, so it's like this deciding if you like exercise, you don't like exercise will really weigh a lot in the decision. Uh, the most common people, uh, most common situation I encounter in um, in the US, which is, I must congratulate everyone because a lot of effort has been done there. Uh, most people are very highly motivated to do exercise. I'm very surprised with this because I'm coming from a country where people hate to do exercise. We don't have that. It's like, maybe it's working too many hours, I don't know. But we don't have that in our culture. And so it's fascinating to see uh, that Yes, we also have to think about the opposites, which is people that really struggle to do exercise and the other people that are really motivated. And when does it make sense for for this group to also change? Right. That doesn't make sense for us to ask, should I be always doing everything? Should I do three times a week boxing? Or would the variation of doing three types of aerobic exercise where I do one one day boxing, one day dance? one day maybe hydrotherapy right do you see the difference the stimulus will be so much different and every time you challenge yourself that means you're really f punching back parkinson right it's um uh, it's it's about it's not even about what we are doing but if it's really challenging you if you become too comfortable in what you're doing then the brain's not getting so challenged 
Another key message uh, would be these are all choices and this might be overwhelming uh, that everyone says you have to do this, 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 right? And I just want to transmit uh, that you have professionals around you that can help you. More than ever, we have access to professionals everywhere. Um, so don't make this talk feel very overwhelming because uh, they are there to help you. And what is the difference is this is a situation that I got from um, an exercise group with Parkinson uh, on, on social media. And I follow, I, I'm interested to see what are people, you know, doing and uh, reporting. And social media seems to be a good way for people to share exercises. And this one actually surprised me a lot. I said, I have to put this one in the talk, uh, which is basically working with someone that uh, might not know so much about Parkinson. And I think, again, nowadays with the access to knowledge that we have, it surprises me that this would happen, right? So if you are doing a Parkinson group, it's not because we we combine a group of people with Parkinson, put them all in the same group, and then say this is Parkinson specific, right? What makes the difference is the instructor having knowledge about the disease, and and applying better things that will be more meaningful. This is part where I think having uh, like a resource, and this is where you would contact, you know, Casey and, and their team, you know, Christine and then the group over there, just because you're going to want to have somebody that probably not only has some training, that's actually, I think we, how we first met you was to do some training with you folks, but also they're going to know who's in your area that, that may, has, may have some expertise, meaning they've seen a number of people with it. I remember uh, in Colorado, we had a situation where a new clinic was opening up down south and someone was telling this story where they get out of the, their uh, bed and, and it's a facility and they stop and, and I'm talking to the physical therapist and, and the PT is going, well, what's going wrong? He's like, well, I'm freezing. And he pulls up pulls up a blanket and it's like, no, no, I'm not freezing like that. I'm freezing a gate. And so you, yeah. you have to have people that know what they're doing. And that's, I think, where you would want to lean heavily on the, on the foundation there to, to help you locate people for that. Yeah. And in this case specifically, it's like imagine the, the instructor is pushing the person. Uh, I think being lazy is a little we like to give positive reinforcement, but sometimes we have that confidence with people and we make so it might be out of context. I don't want to, uh, but it, I think what surprises me is like the person not knowing that there's one side more affected than the other. And that's that's really a red flag. That is uh, um, it's it's easy if if this is the case if you think it because sometimes people don't have access to experts right so we also have to think about that but you guys are here that means you you want to know more uh, you can you accessing knowledge and that means you can also share that knowledge with your instructors so I think uh, there's a growing process from from both sides but this shouldn't happen hit the next slide there but there was a couple of questions that came up here mm -hmm. someone was asking a little bit about um, karate for mm -hmm. parkinson's other martial arts for parkinson's yeah so i actually saw already you can almost find a research study for anything <laughs> and there is one for karate and parkinson yes uh, i've i've seen it i um, imagine the mental focus would be really good too for that know, yeah i think most uh, therapists and researchers will, ah wait a minute what type of study is it but the fact is someone's already thinking about it and it was already uh, pu published as a pilot study to see if it was effective with always optimistic about who publishes, right? Um, so I, I remember finding it interesting because um, we have the boxing as something that people enjoy because it's a, f a feeling of fighting back. And so karate is the same, and but you're adding in movements with the feet, which is quite interesting. And I can share with you that I was part of a research study where we did boxing. We were trying to understand if adding kicking to boxing which you could call kickboxing, but it wasn't. So adding kicks to boxing, if it would bring more benefit over balance. And we were surprised with the results that actually it didn't. Yeah. Both groups improved their balance. And it was like, okay, this is surprising, right? So uh, sometimes it's a protocol, sometimes it doesn't work. So it's, um, it's fascinating to see the amount. You have golf. Uh, I was thinking of sports that I've seen before that are... Well, I remember when you looked up, and, and this ties in a little bit, I remember you looking up Zumba Gold, for, yeah, Zumba for, well. and it was a research out of Cambridge, and you're like, oh, I wanted to be the first, but um, <laughs> <laughs> it worked out. Yeah. I, did, I only bring that up because someone's mentioned in here about your Zumba class that's coming up here in March. Okay, gonna we'll, be... we'll be talking about it in a second, so yeah. maybe we can talk, uh, yeah. you can grab onto the question uh, sure in a will. second. That's good. And there's a couple more... Um, 
Mm -hmm. A couple more coming in here about injuries with boxing, but we'll just let it sit here for okay. a minute. Okay, so the outline of what we're going to do, uh, we're just going to have these key messages, and then we're going to grab specifically onto yep. dance and think about things, boxing as well, and then we'll open up so we can discuss other things that um, that you might be doing more than bringing you overloading with your information. So maybe I'll go through here and you could monitor and see where yeah, it fits. There's a really good question about access to Rocksteady, so I definitely okay. want to do it, but we'll okay. come to it in a bit. So the idea would be here, it's like, how do I know if, um, you know, if, if the instructor has expertise? It's This is not a question of, it's giving you uh, skills to be able to identify what's the difference. So what if I go do a dance class, you know, I don't know, dan line dancing? versus I go to a Parkinson specific dance class, right? What would be the difference? And just a couple of points. One of them would be uh, someone that has expertise in Parkinson will always be focused on the amplitude of the movement. And the amplitude, and so you see big movements, make a big, huge, whatever words they use, right? Um, and then once you get them big, we want them to do it faster with more effort. So these are key words that you will hear from someone that has some knowledge in Parkinson. The other one is someone that is able to balance well what is um, being effective versus safe, right? And keeping keeping that balance is sometimes not uh, the best because people want to to do certain activities, namely in boxing, there are some risk behaviors. And you know, if you have someone like let's not do let's not close our eyes and punch away, right? I'm just giving a, a stupid example, but sometimes it, you know we try to do multitasking and we add in things that might not go so well. Um, so just just also a key message there. And then the third one would be if if I'm uh, as a physiotherapist doing boxing, I want the person to do good movement. I want the person to reach out to step out. So maybe if I'm a boxing instructor, I will keep my pads here. But as a physiotherapist, I will put them everywhere, right? Because I want you to reach up. I want you to reach low. And the instructions that I learned when I took uh, boxing, uh, it's like you keep your pads here so you can protect your shoulders, right? So there's this specific learnings that are applicable if I'm going to go into a fight. <laughs> but we, we're not making fighters, remember? We, we want people to keep well uh, and reinforce movement. So I think, like, for example, the, the cueing with the boxing is beautiful. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. Another one uh, would be in terms of, you know, the, the frequency, thinking about how to adapt. So if I have a group in front of me and I see that two or three people are struggling, I will change the movement. I don't have to tell everyone, you know, let's stop this movement, let's do that. I can just flow and change it. And I'm doing it so that I can keep everyone engaged. Uh, I can see two or three people are becoming more tired. So maybe I can adapt it to, let's bring out our chairs. We're going to do some different exercises. So, you know, that's that's like uh, reading the, the room in terms of being able to identify, I would say, signs that sometimes are not so clear in Parkinson, right? Because we know the facial expression are different. And so it's like we have to be very, um, I would say, agile to think about the posture. We're losing the posture. The person's talking less. We have to find other ways to be able to monitor that maybe uh, the person is not doing so well. And the last one was uh, the teaching methods, which I touched upon when I say I'm looking at the room and I'm trying to change it according to, uh, do I want a moment where I don't want people to think so much and so I just want them to do what I do? Or do I want a moment where I want them to memorize what I'm doing, right? So there's a different, and probably throughout the class or the session, you want different things. You want to end it in a happy way as well, right? Can, can I, I, there's a question in here that's saying that access to rock steady boxing is difficult in the area. Uh, they are not able to get to it easily. Can they mm -hmm. go to other places? And I think this slide might be a good place to just kind of mm -hmm. hit on this, which is. I'm, I'm wondering if in the boxing we can approach it with access. Um, it's just about expertise. Yeah. Because uh, a boxing training program mm -hmm. that's directed towards boxing is going to reinforce that, where someone with mm -hmm. rock steady is going to probably focus more on that. But if yeah. Mets would be an expert that maybe like a PT that, that does that yeah. training and that kind of gets to a study there, but it's just. I, I think if the person wants to uh, then put on your microphone and, and uh, I would, so you can complement with information because sometimes it's, it's uh, the best answer is to understand uh, this, the context Yeah. is if uh, you, you, and you, you're able to access a place where you, where the person might not be specific to Parkinson. 
And I would say if it's easy to access that, I, there's no reason why a conversation with that person where you can transmit this. I, I think there's a role for the person with Parkinson to also help the community get better. So I wouldn't, uh, again, weigh down the barriers of not having access. I really like it. Can I change something in my community so that I can have what I need? But we, we will uh, dive a little bit deeper um, and then maybe uh, free, uh, feel welcome to just open um, the conversation and sometimes it, the question comes out better if you if you express it to us. Currently, can you hear me? Oh, yeah. beautiful, beautiful. Yes, yes. currently I'm uh, in the early stages and most of my concerns are balance. And um, I'm pretty active exerciser as I am. I usually do five to seven sessions per week of aerobics, 30 minutes, 35 minutes either fast walking or elliptical. I also do 25 minutes of yoga stretching every morning out of bed. I also do uh, uh, some uh, meditation therapy, mindfulness and meditation, so that I have a lot of my day filled with things and I'm concerned about the balance issues and whether I should try the dancing, try the Tai Chi, try the boxing. I can't do all of these things. Rock Steady Boxing is about 25 miles from my home. And there are other boxing facilities I understand that are just standard within the city of Pittsburgh. But I appreciate your comments about specific knowledge and expertise in Parkinson's areas. So you just can't go to a gym and ask the guy to teach you how to box if he's going to not know a lot about Parkinson's disease. So I'm trying to figure out what's the best for my particular geographic situation. And mm -hmm. you know, I don't like to dance. I've always had two left feet. Even in high school, I couldn't dance. So <laughs> it's not so attractive to me. I would I would say just in favor of dance, which is usually it's not about it shouldn't be it shouldn't be about the person becoming a boxer and the person becoming a dancer. Um, it should be about doing the big movements with music and but. It, it's um, so I, I would say give it a try once and see if you like it <laughs> because sometimes people surpri are dance. surprised. Yeah, I had this gentleman once say, no, I don't like boxing. I'm not a fighter. I don't he doesn't identify himself with that. But then it was probably the way you you adapted in the way you you applied it. And the person found it very interesting. Um, so <laughs> probably I would say the same thing would go for dance as well. But, uh, but do, you, so, do you specifically he, advocate the rock steady protocols? I would, can uh, can I get back to that question after we go through the boxing yeah. and maybe you will understand everything I will say after. Uh, sure, sure. Yeah, May okay. I say one thing? Two sure. things, sure. actually. Um, we are looking into alternative boxing programs that are taught by people who understand Parkinson's disease and that we can offer more regionally in Pittsburgh so that you will have better access. Um, everyone will have better access. Um, but I also see that David Leventhal joined this group and um, David is the one who started Dance for PD and we are looking to really change up what we do in terms of dance in our region and making it more fun and not dancing to drums and incorporating the great programming that David and his team have in place to really make it fun. We saw them do yeah. some demonstrations at a conference in DC and they have the joint rocket. So we're bringing it to you. No, that's excellent to know. And very nice to see David with us. An amazing human <laughs> Good being. Good thing I'm not going to talk bad about dance with yes. Who would it's, ever do that anyway, right? Uh, the internet would break. It would, <laughs> that it would be, be like, nope. That would be a red flag, like I highlighted. What, did, uh, Christine, just kind of what you were saying before, when I was in Colorado, that's exactly what we did. I mean, Rocksteady is fine. It's kind of they were first there, but um, we made a, a program called Power Punch for Parkinson's, and we built the training in conjunction with the University of Colorado and disseminated it out there. And, and that kind of comes back to, is it better to have a boxing person training for Parkinson's or a Parkinson's person training to boxing? And I kind of lean towards the sec, but I'm, I'm a little biased because I'm, I'm a healthcare provider, mm -hmm. but I think it's eminently doable. And I think, I think Jody would be a great person to talk about that because again, mm -hmm. that's what they do in Colorado and it works very well. And they have a I'm number seeing, 
Yeah, I'm seeing it more and more across all the various regional parks and organizations. They're moving away from Rocksteady and into one even more specifically designed for our PD community. Yeah, okay. I mean, you don't want to get into these, like, who wants to learn these postures and stuff like that? That's not what we're mm -hmm. here for. We're, we're not turning them into boxers. We're turning them into having fun and learning and growing for Parkinson's. It's not a, I don't want to be, uh, who's that guy? Chuck Norris. I'm not working on that. Yeah. <laughs> I would. I was going to highlight later, but since it's in a, yeah. it's very important. I would say important. It's like my my greatest source of of knowledge is really listening to what people are saying. And I did hear once one cent, which is, here I am in my boxing class, and and now a therapist comes in and she's clinifying everything. Right, so, which means what? Means that the therapist must also be careful because. Um, there's a reason why people go to the gym and to the exercise physiologist and so it's like we ha we have to learn a lot from each other in terms of the role that if we overcorrecting people in the class we're taking away the fun yeah. and so i think that sometimes it's forgotten because it's like wait i really want to make this clinical and i want people and then you might not be able to please everyone because some people really want that role and other people don't um, and so it's really about being able, and when the expertise is there, it's like being able to understand the person I have in front and what the person's going to respond better to. Yeah. And I can I can be clinical without being clinical, which means I can do, I can get there, just not have to be verbalizing it. I think that's okay. key. Okay, so, and we will come back to the boxing. I know it's yeah. a popular topic. It's great, it's, I love it. That, but the dance is still winning. <laughs> Of course, she said that for you, David. I'm kidding. No, it, that does have great data. No, it's so uh, we just wanted to highlight about uh, another key message. It's really that when we do research, the protocols are also adapted. And this is really uh, just kind of an interesting anecdote. Uh, this is a big study that came out about a decade ago, and it kind of hit the hit the ground running, and people were very interested because it was published in. New England Journal of Medicine, and it had a really large cohort, had about 195 people. And uh, maybe a year or two after it came out, I actually met one of the people who was teaching it, you know, teaching the actual classes. And she's like, oh, no, this is severely restrictive. We're very careful. We make it very, very uh, stringent controls on how we do that. And that's kind of the insight is that when you see a, a study comes out that talks about uh, um, Tai Chi or something like that, you, they significantly modify the protocol or the, the program they're doing so that it, it it applies directly to Parkinson's and again it's come back to boxing that's exactly what we need to do we need to do the things that are helpful for Parkinson's and eliminate the things aren't, that aren't and so this got great outcomes especially for balance and it was an RCT although not double blinded or whatever but it 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 was not just a standard I'm going to my community center and doing Tai Chi because there are some positions there that you probably wouldn't do that for. Yeah. And I would also add on to this uh, research is the reason why neurologists started referring people yeah. to Tai Chi. It was a real game changer. Um, and so when we think about balance training, this this is the research behind it. Uh, Actually, that, this, this one in particular, yeah. But taking it to the same direction here, uh, Pilates, uh, which is a, an exercise that I really like and, and teach sometimes for Parkinson's, but I end up modifying it very, very directly because here's the first movement in Pilates. It's called the hundreds. And there, if you look at this, this is really kind of a disaster of, uh, of movements and positioning for Parkinson's. You wouldn't want to have people training to be more forward leaning or uh, working on the over strengthening these muscles or straining the back like this. So you do a lot of modifications. And again, when you go to just a community practitioner that probably hasn't gotten some additional training offered through the Parkinson's Foundation uh, of Western Pennsylvania, then you might run into a situation where there's something that may be being reinforced that shouldn't or not being aware of a deficit that's very Parkinsonistic. And, and that's, that's where you run into trouble. Mm -hmm. And I, would, I, was, I took a, a yoga class so I could see what it, and the first position was having your feet crossed over on the floor. I don't know how many here do that, <laughs> but it's it's a challenge. It, and that was the first position. I was like, okay, this is not going to go well. <laughs> and I had some people coming in as well. But people do it. It's true in the community. And it's just being mindful that sometimes uh, some things might not be so so good. One of the main reasons also in terms of expertise, it's um, the knowledge. It's like I can apply everything the same, but 
having expertise allows me to be able to identify crisis situations. And that means, again, the, the fluctuations that we know in a complex disease with so many symptoms, and that sometimes you can have sudden offs and you don't know why, it's unpredictable. And being able to detect those changes as an expert, it's, it's, it's about the amount of time that we have with people with Parkinson, that gives us that expertise. And so that's, that's a big difference. And I don't wanna go into details about that, but it's just highlighting that um, I think it's the safety, when you think about the safety, this is one of the big reasons. Okay, and then another key area or message um, that we've touched upon as well, but highlighting that we, we probably our, our needs change throughout the course of the disease. And so to not feel overwhelmed and like, how am I going to decide when to change and should I change is obviously the professionals that are around you and that having periodic assessments with them will help you take better decisions. Um, so it's, uh, it, it was just to highlight that that some, this is one of the quotes that I took from the group. And it was interesting because there were so many commenters, you can see 18 people commented on saying, maybe it's not the exercise that you're doing. Maybe it's this, maybe you should do this, maybe you should do that, maybe you should do that. And sometimes it's not about the exercise, right? It's about some change that just happened and that the person is not doing so well. And so it's not the exercise. It can be not the exercise and you need really professionals to help you identify these situations. Okay, I'm gonna, the, one of the, the last messages here is uh, really about probably the great benefit that we see in community exercise. And you saw also by the level of evidence, um, community-based exercise, the, the social connection is probably the glue for motivation. So when we're worried about, uh, is this the motivation in ongoing exercise? If you are connected with the people, you might even do things you don't like, right? Because <laughs> it's your friends, you know, so. Uh, but this, uh, we wanted to give you an example in terms of the, the research where you had a group that did exactly the same thing, which I think is very difficult to bias Tai Chi. You have a specific group of movements that you're doing. The instructor is going to influence little, right? So it's not like he's giving a lot of instructions. So that obviously uh, not this, uh, which means sometimes if you have a bouncy instructor, you will react in a different way. So let's assume that the, the Tai Chi was exactly the same, but what they saw is that the people that did it in a group format had better cognitive results and motor results as well. And also exercise compliance was one of the main outcomes. So it's very interesting to see that when I started doing physiotherapy, we always thought individual would be better because you know I could really focus on the person. And now everything is pointing me in the other direction that we get so much out of the groups that it's probably worth losing a slight benefit. I find sometimes when I'm teaching some of the voice stuff that the the people will will cue each other in a way that's much more I would say direct <laughs> than I would, and it's kind of like they're, they're calling each other a little bit on it. It's, it makes them a little bit more motivated. It's a nice it's a nice way to yeah. pull it all together. Okay, and so now we wanted to create a just a little more dynamic, and would be uh, how about we think about different modalities. Uh, exercise modalities and rank them with stars. What do you think? So here are our stars that we're going to use for the exercise. And that would be uh, our aerobic exercise is our red star. Let's try to memorize our colors. And then we have our agility and balance is and dual task will be our greenish uh, star. We have our strength with orange and green with flexibility. And I'm adding in a gold star, which is fun. And one of the ways for us to have lots of dopamine if we're having fun, right? So uh, the enjoyment component cannot be uh, uh, disvalued, I would say. So, of course, and in honor of David that's <laughs> yeah. here with us, we my, knew this was my, happen. my first trials of Dance for PD after taking the program in Madrid. <laughs> I, I hope he approves. <laughs> um, and so, obviously, let me just lower the sound so that we can talk. Uh, as you, uh, what was, um, I would say dance is obviously close to my heart because both of my parents dance a lot because a lot of therapists say, oh, what, but what if I don't like to dance? And it's like, you know, it's, it's, you don't have to be a dancer, you know, it's just, it's about feeling the music. It's the cue of the music, right? It's, uh, it facilitates movement. And I think sometimes people are afraid of it because it's like, yeah, I'm not going to be able to have that sway. But every, I mean, anything is dance, right? If you think about it, 
any movement. Each, each person has their own style. And so it's um, even if you haven't tried it and you think, no, I'm not going to be able to do it. When people are dancing, they're not looking at others. I think most of the people are, you know, trying to feel the music and trying to do their, their thing. So um, try it. I think it's, it's worth the trying. So that's obviously the, mo the well most well-known program that we know in Parkinson's Dance for PD. And David, if you want to chip in and use your voice, obviously this, this uh, I'm sure you've had lots of talks uh, with this community. And it, it is a program to seek something more specific because of the focus on the amplitude as well. And obviously the, the, the engagement component of the society. Um, so, and I think that you have classes already going, Christine, right? Okay. One of the things that I've been exploring as someone that likes to dance and to try to incorporate it in therapy is the difference, trying to focus on the difference between there's moments in the class where I would just want people to relax, to, to not think a lot, right? So just do what I do and let's just feel the music, right? And then there's moment that maybe there's that I want to do something more specific and I'm just using music. I usually say when everything else fails, dance always comes to the rescue. So I can have someone even with very cognitive severe issues, very motor severe issues. I put on the music that the person likes and everything flows. So it's almost like impossible for me to have a session without any type of music. But this would be an example of maybe we can think of. So this is Irish dancing. There was actually a research study that already proves the feasibility and the results. I saw David dancing with this researcher in one time in <laughs> Dublin at a conference. So yes. yeah, they actually went to his class, David. So, so when we think about social activity, we're not thinking, okay, it's it's the aerobic component is very strong, right? So we have our red star. We are memorizing. There's always a social engagement, and social engagement we know is also cognition. So we, we're going to give our green star, and the fun is obviously there. And so we have our our yellow star as well, right? Our golden star, for sure. And then can we add in more is the question. Can I use dance to add in just a little bit more? And when I would say, OK, so what if I use the movements that we are reinforcing with the Lisa One Big program, the amplitude, and I put music to it? And this would be the result. <laughs> Of course, I'm a big fan of uh, of Zumba Fitness just because the variety of music, right? So it's like uh, the people will react better to the music that they identify themselves to. So by and uh, so Zumba Fitness, they basically organize different types of, of music. And so I just combine it easily. And that's the passion. But this just to say, I don't know if the, if, the, if it's coming out because I forgot to optimize the video, but hopefully sure we can see that, yes, I'm reinforcing the big movements. I can also squat down and do a nice little movement and have the strength training. Okay. For time's sake, let me just pass forward and highlight that uh, we, we have been challenged to create a, a Zumba Gold uh, program. So Zumba Gold means it's adapted for uh, people that have that are more elderly. And I would say let's adapt it even more for Parkinson. And so this would be uh, something that is coming I'm up back. in March available to you. I'm back. Okay, now I always be, look very cheerful because when you're dancing, you're cheerful, right? So, <laughs> um, and it's it's about again, it's not about being able to uh, to, to be a, a dancer or to create dance routines. It's it's about reinforcing the bigness movements, engage people in an aerobic exercise. So our primary goal is really the aerobic component. Um, perfection, no. I know there's a compromise, especially if you're doing it online. People are focused on a screen, so there is a, a more cognitive challenge to that as well. Uh, the changing, I do, I do change frequently because I'm reading the group, and everyone knows that, and it becomes the cognitive component, which is how quickly can you change with me, right? So hopefully, some of you will join me when this um, starts. I could not uh, let this opportunity go without um, inviting you to join in March. Sorry, is it uh, Monday? Question? How do we, how do we join? It, it'll be an online program. 
so I'm pretty sure that probably the the foundation will send to you yeah. uh, a link with the invitation, so it will be disseminated. We haven't gone to that part, so yeah. it will it will come. <laughs> it will be on Wednesdays. Wednesdays at one p.m. virtually. Well, we'll it send out yeah. it starts on March first. Yeah. Good. Um, yes. So, so, okay. Boxing that everyone was asking about. Maybe we can uh, jump in and check some some of the questions as well. I, I've been monitoring it, but I feel like I want to be careful with our timing. Yeah. Um, okay. Just to that, see if this. Uh, Dave if had a great cogent to... comment about cross training, doing the different boxing with the dancing gives you two different kinds of ways to mm -hmm. address the or attack the problem, and I think that's yeah that, that's key. You can do a lot of one, but I think yeah. it's get to get the variety, and we got into that a little bit earlier. Uh, I think boxing, there's no, it can be used in so many ways, and these are two examples that I want to give you. Home calls, I use it. I want this person to be able to be engaged in an exercise. Is it really relevant that he has the gloves on? It's it's relevant to him. It it empowers. Yeah. Uh, it's fun. I want him to be able to work on his transfer, and so that's why I'm using it. This other gentleman is obviously memorizing a whole sequence. Let me take the. He's using voice with boxing. Yeah. Phrases. If this is okay, this is this. You, how do boxing sessions usually uh, occur? From my understanding, you have different circuits, right? And uh, uh, places where people go and and do specific exercises. I personally like this format where I do have them. It's like. It's, it's not each one of them are doing their own thing. They have an activity that they're doing, and, and I go specifically to each one and say, why don't you add in going to the floor, right? So, and this is the result of, let me see this. We implemented a boxing program in Sweden, and the goal was to try to understand how easy was it to just go to a boxing club, to, to give some knowledge to the instructions, to, to the instructors, and these were all uh, boxers. So, um, I would say a very uh, interesting boxing club in Sweden. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, so we, we did a whole follow up. This was a, a, a published paper that we had. One of the major learnings that we had was that people usually go back to their comfort zone. So it's, uh, it's, it's not me going there and saying, do this. That doesn't make any sense. It's show me what you guys usually do and how can I help you make this a little bit more specific for Parkinson. So we have a lot to learn from each other for sure. And I'd say what we decided to do is to create, uh, you know, some videos for the instructors to have something that even when people are working on their own in specific places in the gym, they can have something that maybe challenges them a little bit more. So creating specific sequences that would be um, in terms of cognition and not just punching, right? Not just punching. Take a step, two punches. So we can make it, we can make it better and we can make it richer and we can put music and, you know, so it's, it's up to the whole community to come together to be able to make these things more specific. One of the learning points was that people actually, we asked them which part of the class they enjoyed most. And the results were very interesting because people said they liked the warm up and the cool down better, best, compared to everything else. And that's fascinating because that is just the moment when they were actually all together. Trying to get so back again, to if we thing. can create, yeah, a group the activities. we're talking about in the chat. Yeah. Yep. And these were things that we we uh, did a, just a quick survey online to see what people, uh, mostly because the research studies have report too little of adverse events and things that go wrong. And so, you know, let's just go to social media and see what people say. Why do they uh, stay in the program? Why do they leave a, a boxing program in this case? And this was some of the feedback. And so some people feel that it's not enough challenge. Other people said, okay, I couldn't stop injuries was an issue. We have, again, the reinforcement of not enough challenge for me. I feel like I'm pushing the group down. Uh, the schedules was an issue. The costs and the geographic barriers getting to the places as well. Feeling that maybe I'm not exact. It's very difficult to create groups where everyone will be perfectly, you know, synchronized, right? So um, do people create level one, level two, but, you know, sometimes you have a bad day and maybe you might be level two. So. Um, it's it has to be a lot of friendship has to be in place for this to work better. And we've we've touched upon this about in terms of identifying in boxing maybe the specific situations that we want to maybe avoid. And um, and I would say that the posture is one of them. 
because of what John was highlighting, how sometimes you're so focused on the boxing that maybe your posture is not in the best uh, place. And that's why we use the pads up high. And um, I would say that's most impulsive behaviors with person with people with Parkinson that are young onset sometimes can can occur. It's like, you know, you, you just you you really want to to do the best in effort. And then sometimes things might not go so well. But I don't want to go into too much detail yeah. because I think answering your questions will be more important. Yes. So we're I mean, coming back to our stars and probably just answering a couple of questions before we leave. Sure. If we... Well, I do see that the, the dance for PD is on Fridays at 2 p.m. Okay. Cool. And there, there's an email available there. Casey put that up there. Um, uh, there's also someone talking about joining me in a dance class without any effort. Oh, good. It, someone can dance like Elaine from Seinfeld. That's an oxymoron. <laughs> oh, no, it's Christine. <laughs> yeah, um, good. Yeah, I'm with you. Yeah, I, when she does it and I'm following her, it, it looks great. But if she disappears, all of a sudden, like, and now I'm back in the twilight zone. But it's still fun. Yeah, um, yeah See, I think we got through most of these here. If anyone wants to reach out for a question itself, yeah. I think our last message is obviously that Maybe it's the way we're placing the question is not right. It's like, which is the best exercise? No, which is the best exercise for what problem? Decide what the problem is, and then you can get a, right, a correct answer, right? Um, if, if not, and then in general, it's like it has to be something that challenges you. We know this for what the best research to support it. And then obviously thinking about it challenges you in key areas. They're not all the same. So try to just uh, make sure that you have at least the most important ones. And obviously, never forgetting that it has to be engaging and enjoyment, right? Doing, and this is where that sentence comes from. It's like, do what you like. No, it's important, really important that people enjoy what they're doing. I think I see Christine. That's her hand up. I do have a question. Yeah. I know um, Heather Kennedy, Kathleen Kiddo to the community, loves your Zumba Gold class. And uh, we're so excited to be bringing it to our community. I just wondered if you could share some more details about, um, you know, is it is it something that people at all stages of PD can participate in? Is it geared more to one group than another? You know, initially we we were trying to okay, should we push more? It's um, even from from my experience, if I put on rock and roll, it doesn't matter how the person is, they will move, <laughs> right? And I think everyone knows this. You see all these videos of all social media, right? So if if the music really moves you, the only barrier I would say is if someone goes and says, I don't like the music. And even so, I usually ask people, send me the music that you like, and we will adapt to the movements. Um, so I wouldn't say if we have people that are maybe sitting down or people in standing position, I'm always using some form of arm movements so that even if you're sitting down, you feel that you are also engaged in that in that moment. Um, I would say creating rules at this moment, we have nothing to guide us about those rules uh, because people react. And I think dance is usually that, that type of exercise that can combine anyone. And we are mindful. And I would say I've had experiences online, even with people with dementia, and it it's the only thing that works online. <laughs> Uh, through the pandemic, we struggled a lot, and it's it's really uh, where we go to to be able to keep people engaged. So I would say uh, try it. It's not about being doing the as fast as I do. I have to push the group, so I usually push for the for the strongest in terms of rule, so that everyone is is trying to get to this to to that right. Because if if I'm doing it too slow, people have given a comment that they don't feel challenged, and you see that from the the comments you saw also from the boxing, so we lose those people, right? So it's feeling that you're giving your most without having to do exactly as the teacher does. I hope that helps, but yeah, try so. it. <laughs> Good comment. And David seconded. Okay, I see someone right there. I can't quite get to your name, but I can see if, uh, uh, Frederick, what you got? When you talked about the New England Journal article in 2012 in Tai Chi, uh -huh. I, thought I, I thought I detected that you said it had to be a very specific Tai Chi protocol, which wasn't the type usually seen in the community. Is that what I was hearing? It, basically, what they did is they picked the best forms, and then Dr. Lee, who was an expert actually, um, trained the people who were giving the different the different uh, 24, 24 weeks. And so, yes, it's not the standard forms. Now, I wouldn't say that you have to do exactly that particular protocol that has great evidence, but uh, a clinician or a, a 
an exercise professional that knows a thing or two about Parkinson's is going to know, oh, I need to probably not do this part. Or they may be, be able to read the room the way Josepha would in a, in a dance class to get to eliminate or mitigate those kinds of issues. And then, and then Frank, uh, Frederick, the same, the same situation when I talk about Pilates, the first thing you, I would do is I get rid of about half of the forms because half of them are really crunchy things. Same thing with boxing. The first thing they want you to do is this great guard position. Well, I don't want that. I want you to be upright, even if it means you're not going to be as effective in the ring if you were in a fight because we're not training that. So, yes, that, to answer your question, the answer is must be modified to be most beneficial to address your specific issue, and that's why you want someone with expertise. Any more questions yep, uh, that please. we can um, hopefully the information was useful, you know, red pill right. or blue pill, which one would you choose? <laughs> Both. Where, where are you based now, Josepha? <laughs> well, I work in Lisbon at the Parkinson Association in Lisbon, but we do a lot of work online as well. So yeah. I'd say Welcome the online. virtual reality is my gym. <laughs> and where is, where, is John based? where is John based? I'm in Portugal now. Uh, I'm from Cincinnati originally, and I go back and forth, but I spend the bulk of my time over here. So, yeah. And, yeah. <laughs> I see you, Brad. Yeah, I saw him. He comes in quite a bit. Uh, yeah, he, <laughs> he's a lifer now. <laughs> um, people coming in from, from other groups. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks, Fred. Any well, somebody? Thank you. Okay. I know we oh, went a little bit you. over. I'm sorry, guys. Okay, this is wonderful. Please, please try Zumba, dance for PD. We also have a Tai Chi class on Tuesdays at 1030. These yep. are all uh, virtual offerings. And this was excellent. Thank you everyone for attending. And we'll see you next time. Thanks. Thanks, Thank for, thanks for joining us. See Don't you soon. About pedaling beyond awesome, but keep dancing. <laughs> What's the pedaling program again? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs>